Um, while we're all making confessions, I also started my career at the Office for National Statistics <laughs> many <Why>? years ago. <laughs> I have been a civil servant for 23 years, working in government statistics and government social research. Um, and I've been working perhaps for the last nine or 10 years around um, li the linking of administrative data. So, um, so yeah, all, uh, all a long time in this field. And I'm still very excited about it, I have to say, but that might just be because I'm an enormous geek. Um, <laughs> So I'm actually going to talk about it from the government perspective, from the devolved government perspective, to be precise. Um, obviously, there are issues in England at the moment. I'm not sure, really sure what's going on there. But, um, but yes, um, as far as the admin data research partnership goes, um, the centre in Wales has been refunded. Um, and in Welsh Government, we're going to be having um, a team of people um, to work on this sort of area. So we're hoping that although we've already extremely committed to providing data to our research centre in Wales and to any of the other centres in the UK that are interested in having it, um, we'll be able to do even more going forward, which will be really exciting. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about um, the vision I personally have for the future of admin data, particularly for Wales, but anybody else is very free to join me in my uh, crusade um, and then talk about <coughs> the importance of... Um, of secure settings in, in bringing that about. <coughs> and I'm realising I should have got some water. If I can find my bag. Rather than growl all the way through it, I will actually just take a moment. <coughs> right. And, to, and I'm going to give you some policy related examples to enjoy. Um, and then talk about how it's actually a failure of duty not to link data. Okay, so as government, we spend millions of pounds collecting data about all kinds of things, all about our citizens. Um, every programme that we deliver to our citizens out in the real world, we're collecting information about, about what we're delivering to them. It's not being collected for research purposes, but it could very easily be used for research purposes. Um, when you talk to citizens, when you do um, research about um, public engagement with the data linking agenda, they're actually all really surprised we don't already link all of this stuff together. Um, and plus in really challenging economic times, these slides are a little bit old, but actually that's still very much the case, still very challenging economic times. Um, we basically need to make the most of our existing resources. Um, and obviously there is the ethical issue that the volume and richness of this admin data should be being used for public good. So there are both challenges and benefits to using admin data, but safe settings are what we need to provide the assurance that government needs to share their data. So I'll just share with you uh, a diagram of my, my vision for the future. Um, Basically, in the middle there, you've got, you've got your funnel. That's, that's your safe setting with all your different data sets there. Um, and basically, in terms of the inputs, um, we're working harder and harder to create um, flows into that safe setting. Um, so in Wales, um, we've got a project that's actually called the Data Flow Development Project, and that's all about automating data flows from our local authorities into our safe setting in Wales. Um, so that they can um, deliver data not just for researchers but actually for monitoring pro pur purposes as well for us in government. Um, we're trying to bring in data on various government programmes that we have in Wales. Uh, we already have in our safe setting in Wales, we're very lucky to have our routine health records already in the SAIL data bank, which is um, part of our safe setting. Um, in terms of those automated data flows, um, our local authorities and public uh, public sector bodies have all kinds of st uh, st statutory statistical returns that they have to give to Welsh Government. So we're hoping that in the long run we'll be able, actually be able to replace some of those by using these automated data flows into our safe setting so that automated aggregate information can come flowing out again at the other end. As I say, those the government programmes, a lot of those are run by local authorities and so we're looking to bring in all kinds of records from them. 
We also, um, many years ago, I think back in 2012, we first started putting consent link on all our surveys. Um, we've now learned that we don't really need to ask consent to link anymore, so we've stopped doing it. Um, but basically, all our national surveys in Wales and any surveys that we can get hold of that are, take, that are uh, undertaken in Wales, um, we're trying to get the survey data brought into our safe settings as well. In terms of the outputs, as I say, there's all sorts of exciting opportunities there that are helpful to the research community, but also very much to government. Obviously, what we're trying to do is balance the requirements of both of those. Um, the, the happier you can make a data provider, uh, the more likely they are to provide their data. And obviously, if we can get that data driven in, then it's available to be used by the research community. So there's all kinds of possibilities for the future of what we can do with those automated outputs. Um, in Wales, we have a website called Stats Wales, um, and all of our statutory statistical information is available on there. Um, the research um, user or even members of the general public um, can interrogate the statistics and download um, Excel spreadsheets of the data that stand behind um, our statistical bulletins. Um, but essentially, it would be possible to drive data out in aggregate form from our safe setting into um, that kind of interactive data website. Um, in the long run, again, it'd be very useful to be able to populate dashboards. So we're driving information in from our different government programmes. So we could create dashboards that are automatically populated from aggregate information um, designed within that safe setting. So we'll pop it out into a dashboard so you can have a look at what's going on with your different government programmes across the country. Um, equally, um, data portals, um, so your data is flowing in, very useful for the person who's funding that, um, that programme to be able to have a look at what's going on in there. So we're working with our safe setting um, to deliver um, a gateway into knowledge analysis, analytical services within Welsh Government, um, so our analysts will be able to actually go in and look at the data dynamically arriving in our safe setting and, and being delivered by that programme. Um, one of the very interesting things that we've been doing recently with one of our programmes is delivering um, a cost offset model that's being fed by data that's being brought through the safe setting and that's the kind of thing that we're interested in delivering and developing further in the longer run. Um, one, of the, um, one of our programmes is called Supporting People which provides £124 million of homelessness prevention support to about 60,000 people in Wales every year and we're just on the verge of completing uh, a cost offset model that's being populated using some of the data from the safe setting. Um, the kinds of cost offset models that you have at the moment tend to rely on professional judgment around what, the, um, what would be the result if that support hadn't been given. Whereas with our safe setting, where we've got all kinds of information about um, from the routine health records, we can actually populate it with information about the real, um, the real results of not getting that support by looking at our control, our control group who haven't received that support and see what happens with their, their use of, uh, of the routine, uh, the, NA, well, the NHS basically in Wales. Um, another um, interesting project that we've got going on in Wales um, that we're actually again waiting for at UK level data for in fact, which is one of our main problems I would say in Wales. Um, we're very keen on and we do provide all our government data to our safe setting basically in Wales um, but we're still reliant on um, UK government departments to get access to things like DWP, HMRC data which we're in the process of trying to get hold of, hoping that we'll be able to get hold of very soon. Um, but basically we have in Wales, as all the countries of the UK have, um, an index of multiple deprivation and that's um, an area-based index at the moment. Um, but one of the projects that we're hoping to begin work on very soon when we've got that DWP data is um, an individual or household level in, um, deprivation score. Um, and that again, that would be done within the safe setting using a variety of the different data sets that are in there. Um, obviously when you have an area-based deprivation measure, you know that that's, um, that's an average score for the whole area, but within that you might have pockets of deprivation and pockets of affluence. So if you had an individual or household level score, then you can, you can have a, a better understanding of where those hotspots are. Equally, as you flag 
the recipients of all those different, different government programs across the country, um, you can start to look at where multiple interventions are happening. And if you once flag up all your multiple interventions and you map all your multiple deprivations, you can have a little look about whether those things match up. And actually, if they do, well, maybe there are different ways to deliver a programme to those very troubled families. Um, and where they're not, well, actually, let's think about where we can target our services better. So all these kinds of things um, are potentially um, ways that we can use the data flows in and out of our safe settings in order to inform policy decision making. But we do need to get it right, as these guys have been talking about. Um, the admin data quality can be poor. As I said, it's not, it's not designed for research purposes. Um, so there's a certain amount of time needed, uh, a bit of patience, um, and a lot of resources to improve the data collection once we start looking at it. Um, we've got 22 local authorities in Wales, and they've each been collecting their data in different ways for many years. Um, and different ways for different programmes, and some of them put, for example, the supporting people homelessness prevention stuff in housing, and some of them put it in social care. So there's an awful lot of complexity around it, but if you don't start, you definitely don't finish. So, you know, ma we're making a start, we're going there, we're uh, making that push, making that effort. Um, and obviously we need to assure data controllers that it's safe and legal. So obviously Welsh Government, we're very very much at the forefront there. We're very convinced. We're very much using our, our secure setting. Um, but our local authorities, some of them still need a bit of persuasion. Um, so that's still a role for us there. Um, access and participation can be problematic. So we try to have a combination of carrots and sticks there. Um, so in terms of our routine data flows, we're trying to provide at the moment an NRDA, National Research Data Appliance. That's basically an automated data linking engine, a piece of software that can be provided to our local authorities that actually speeds up the process of them providing their data to the safe setting. So we see that as a carrot to our local authorities to be able to provide their data, and they're all very excited about that. Um, but equally, we're providing a few sticks by building into grant terms and conditions for some of those programmes, supporting people as an, as an example, that they must provide individual level data to our secure setting for research and monitoring purposes. So in terms of privacy concerns and public acceptability, um, obviously that's also, that's, that's, that's an issue across the board. Our ministers are members of the general public essentially. They, some of them may have been in government for a long time, but they don't necessarily understand all the, all the complexities of this. Um, so privacy concerns and public acceptability are uh, as important to us as civil servants trying to persuade our ministers to take part in this kind of stuff and to invest in it as it is to persuade the public that this is an acceptable way forward. Um, but basically the evidence shows that the better the public understand these things, the more comfortable they are. Um, public tend to be reassured by the safeguards that our safe settings can provide. So they, they're interested in um, secure data storage, they want to know about the strict access controls that are being placed around the data. Um, they're keen to know about data destruction, although as time goes on, what we're trying to achieve um, is that data is um, kept ongoing within our secure setting, because obviously that reduces the amount of time it takes to provide data, that we're not providing it over and over. Um, essentially, our, our ideal situation um, is to maintain those data sets long term and keep updating them year on year so that they are become a, a rich longitudinal resource and obviously we're very interested in the transparency around outputs and publications um, as a researcher working within government I think I, I have known um, an attitude um, among the public that um, researchers and statisticians working in government might be open to the influence of, of uh, politicians and ministers in fact we are um, we're all part of independent um, professions within government, independent technical professions. Um, we are signed up to being independent within government. We have a challenge role within government. Um, we absolutely do not allow um, any, any messing about with our, uh, with our uh, findings. And we're, we're very much in the, in, the, in the camp of being completely transparent and independent with all of our findings. So there are some bits that only the geeks care about, but I'm going to tell you about them because I'm guessing this room is a bit of a room full of geeks. 
Um, adding admin data to survey data. That's something that's um, always really useful. Um, it's useful in a geeky way to help us validate our survey answers. Um, so looking at what the reported disability might be in our surveys versus the kinds of records that you have from the NHS around disability. Um, it helps us to better understand non-response and design better waiting strategies because we know more about the people who didn't respond. We can potentially shorten interviews and therefore make our interviews more interesting because we're not asking the basic factual stuff. We're just hopefully increasing response rates because we can pick up some of the information from routine records once the data goes into the secure setting. Um, and it allows us to potentially reduce or better target our primary data collection. We might be able to just do less of it, bother the public less, because we've got information about them from other sources. Obviously, it's in important to be able to triangulate between sources. Um, it's interesting to look at mode effects, learn more about the strengths and limitations of individual sources, and provide as full a picture as possible. Because obviously there might be reasons why people report things differently in surveys than how we see it in routine records. And those things are actually interesting to us. It teaches us something about that topic and about public understanding. And essentially it's all about, from our point of view as analysts in government, continuous data improvement. We're, we're always trying to improve the data, improve our estimates, um, make, it, make as accurate um, an estimate as possible about um, what we're delivering, the impact it's having and so forth. And, and, and the, the idea of automating all of this stuff, using a, a safe setting to bring data in and then spit data out, will free up analytical time to interpret the evidence, which is actually what we should be doing in government, is helping our policy colleagues understand the implications of the evidence that we're delivering to them, help <coughs> ministers understand what we should and shouldn't be doing and what we have. Um, so actually, um, although it's this, this is the geeky stuff, it saves everyone time and it therefore saves our policy colleagues money and ministers money and that's good news. So I've been in government statistics and government social research for 23 long years now um, and some of the opportunities for policy are, are massive in terms of um, the use of linked administrative data and the use of these safe settings. Um, it has been known for example, it's very rare of course, almost never happens that a policymaker will roll out a program without evaluating a, uh, the pilot or without collecting a baseline. Never happens. No, of course not. Um, so one of my major challenges over the last 23 years um, is can to some extent be fixed because all of the data that's in these um, secure settings is by its very nature longitudinal. So um, to some extent we're able to look back in time and look at what that baseline would have been retrospectively. Some of the health data in our sale data bank, which is part of our secure setting, goes back to 1999. Um, so it gives us the opportunity to roll back time and see what would our baseline have looked like if we had been sensible enough to collect it in the first place. Also, the more information we bring in, the richer the data source that we create, the better we can create things like match control <laughs> cases to allow us to do comparative analysis all very useful so that we can figure out what impact those programmes are actually having in practice. It allows us to, once we've flagged an intervention cohort, follow them up over time. Um, obviously it's going to cost us money to do that analysis, but it's not going to cost us real money in the real world to go and find the real people and find out what's happened to them. So for example, one of the programmes that we're working with in Welsh Government is Flying Start, which is a bit like um, Shore Start was in England, early years intervention. And obviously what we'd really like to be able to do is follow them through the education system and look at their later life chances. And once we've flagged them in our safe setting, we'll be able to follow them over time and look at very long-term outcomes. Um, so health, child health is, is very interesting now. Education outcomes will be very interesting for the next 20 or 30 years. Um, but their, their later life chances are all very interesting to keep an eye on at no additional data collection cost. And as I say, linked admin data is na naturally longitudinal, so that's, that's fascinating stuff from our point of view. Um, it allows us to disentangle cause and effect, obviously with our, the kinds of national surveys that we've been doing for many, many years. We can look at the proportion of the population who are disabled and the proportion who are in the labour market, but we can't look at um, which has caused which. Um, and we can look at the dynamics of things like poverty and social mobility. Um, you know, are, are the, is the population 
in Wales of people in poverty, um, a group that's just diving in and out of the, along the poverty line, or are they in kind of long-term deprivation? And only by looking at those dynamics over time can we do that. Um, we can also plot user journeys through services, and that helps us to see where people are moving in and out, um, and having a look at um, what destinations people might have. Um, so, for example, we've been doing some work with um, South, the police forces in South Wales around missing children. There's quite a lot of work gone on in our secure setting around domestic violence um, and substance misuse. It's very interesting to look at the destinations of those people. Okay, I will, I'll get a move on, Peter. Um, and in terms of policy making, obviously, um, it, these are gen it's genuinely cross-cutting because you're bringing together more and more data sets that although they're not held in a linked way, they are all linkable. So you're able to look at something like um, housing and health, which is one of, our, was one of our new interests within Welsh Government that we're investing heavily in. It lets us research wicked problems, things that are multi-causal, need multiple solutions, um, and need joined up working to fix, things like substance misuse, mental health and obesity. We have an aspiration in Wales to improve our population data. Um, the, the ideal would be to have the richness around the population that you would have if, as if it was a survey. That would allow you to have better estimates for rare groups in the populations, people with rare conditions, and people in small areas, which is also always going to be useful to our local authorities. And as I say, various policy-making tools, um, like cost offset models and options appraisal, the ability to figure out what would happen if you applied each of the different options you're considering in terms of rolling out a policy. And the possibility of better modelling. Um, if you've got a very rich base of population information, the kind of modelling you do will be improved because you know more about the people you're modelling it on. And we're able as government, we're very interested in the fact that you know, a lot of the time we're approaching things as an area-based intervention. So we pick an area that has poor housing and we intervene. Um, but we also ask individuals who think they may um, have poor housing and meet our criteria to um, approach schemes directly and looking at the admin data will allow us to compare those two approaches and as I said before flagging multiple deprivation and flagging multiple in in interventions potentially we could change policy making forever so um, you can get access to these slides I believe afterwards so I will not talk through these examples in detail because I've spent far too long talking already um, but there are basically five examples in these slides of areas where data linking has been used to directly inform policy. So this one is about New South Wales, sorry, New South Wales in Australia. They managed to reduce their suicide rate after release from prison by figuring out when to intervene and they actually changed their policy as a result. Supporting people in Wales, um, we've done some research there. We did some um, feasibility work looking at um, whether the, the programme was reducing the burden on health services and we were able to give some um, initial evidence that that was the case and we've now got a four-year all-Wales study to look at that. Participation in higher education, this is a piece of work that was done by uh, not very far away from here, ALSPAC, looking at young people and their destinations and that was able to um, identify some ways that um, giving advice to young people could help them um, overcome some of the barriers to moving into higher education. In Wales again, a fuel poverty study where we linked our fuel poverty scheme data to health records and we were actually able to demonstrate some impacts on respiratory and cardiovascular health and that's actually directly influenced our successor scheme on fuel poverty by widening that scheme to people who are uh, not just on specific benefits, which is what it was being offered to, but it's now being offered to low-income people who are, um, in, who, who are not on benefits but who do have respiratory and cardiovascular disease. So that's a direct policy impact. Um, I'll just whiz through that one, but there's another one there from Canada that was talking about educational outcomes uh, of, of young children. So I'll just get to my final point, which is the issue of the fact that it's actually a failure of duty not to link data. This is a message that we can all take to um, data providers. Um, it's one we're signed up to ourselves, but basically there, you know, there's evidence that public services 
who are, um, who are on, up with this agenda, who are able to harness the power of admin data, are more likely to have an edge over those who don't. It means we have to accept a certain amount of messiness with the data. As I say, this is not data that's designed for research purposes, but it's got an awful lot of potential. Um, so the benefits, in our view, vastly outweigh the challenges. And when you're looking at the population level, a little bit of messiness I think we can live with. And as Professor Fiona Stanley, who is also an Australian academic, argues, data linking save, saves lives. Um, you don't just need the data to be good, you need it to be joined up. Um, and um, Barton Noppers, who is at McGill University, has argued that it's actually against our human rights for a government not to share our data, because we have a right um, to share in scientific advancement and its benefits um, from, in terms of the data, our data having been shared. Um, so we can activate these human rights by promoting responsible data sharing. So the best practice and protocols and procedures to address privacy concerns will give governments the confidence to share data and the value of safe settings to evidence-based policy making simply can't be underestimated. That's my thing.